and be free to be the same person no matter who you're around, no matter what person you're around. You should be the same person, man. You, you, you don't act one way in front of one group of people and another way in front of another group of people because you want to make sure you're accepted by both groups equally. He says, be yourself. Be, know who you are in Christ so that you can be the same person. I mean, it makes kind of sense, right? Um, recently, a friend was... Uh, a friend of church was describing a mutual friend who I only know in a church setting, but they know in a church setting and in a work setting. Uh, something, you know, workplace, non-Christian environment, all that good stuff. And, uh, and, and they were describing this person, and one of the very first things that they commented about this individual is they're like, yeah, this person is awesome. Like, like, literally, like, there's no filter on how they are in church compared to how they are in work. Like they talk the same, like they were in the church foyer having a conversation or whether they were at work and talking to their non-Christian friends about God and just saying, man, I'm just so thankful for what God's doing in my life. And just really, you know, I've really been enjoying just my quiet time and I've been reading my Bible and this is what I feel like God is speaking to me. And they're like, they, they talk like these people like love God and know who God is. And, and, and you know, it's amazing. And, and I was like, man, how cool is that? Like just to have, have that ability not to, not to feel like you have to filter anything based on whatever group of people you're around. Now, I think there's definitely, uh, 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 you know, kind of the ability to kind of be in a marketplace. As most of you uh, are in a marketplace job with non-Christians, which is incredible, and there's still tact and there's still ways to do it. But how how cool of it is is it to know that that you can you know who you are in God, you know your identity, and you're not. It's not coming from a motivation to try to have to. Be a people pleaser and earn the acceptance and the approval of people who don't not get, know God because you're trying to filter that. You guys see what I'm you know saying? You tracking a little bit? Okay, cool. And uh, and and that idea of being fearful of man's opinion is kind of what Paul's uh, going after. Uh, Proverbs 29:25 it says, uh, "Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord uh, is kept." Uh, safe. I don't know about you guys, but I can tell you the fear, you know, <laughs> being driven by the approval of people, it can be exhausting, can it? I mean, when you're ch- constantly filtering your actions and your decisions uh, based on your perception of what other people will think about it, I mean, it's it's like, it weighs down on you, man. It's a full-time job to keep up with that, you know? Uh, and, and, and I think Paul is, is wise in addressing that as one of the very first things that he goes after. You know, someone once said that uh, becoming obsessed with what people think about you is the quickest way to forget what God thinks about you. And if, you're, if your self-worth is being validated 100% uh, by the opinions of people, then there's no room for God to validate you, is there? Because you're already you know, looking for your validation in other sources. And so Paul says, listen, man, you need freedom knowing that you don't need the approval of man to be successful and to know who you are and achieve all that God has for you. Somebody say... Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, next one. Galatians 2.16, it says, Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. For no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. Galatians 2.16, the fear of having to earn God's approval. The fear of having to earn God's approval. You need to position yourself. You need to earn your right so that God loves you. You need to earn your place in God's kingdom. You need to earn your place as a son or a daughter. You got to prove your worth, and that's exactly what uh, that these these folks were now hearing after Paul departed. They said, "Man, you got to be circumcised." You know, for our purposes today, it's just external religious practices. What are you adding to your life to try to position yourself and earn God's love, earn God's favor, earn uh, God's ability to come and give you traction in a certain area of your life? He said, man, you got to squash that. You can't earn God's approval. He says, man, if you add this one thing and say, okay, you've got to now do this one thing, that means you have to do all of the law of the Old Testament. That's where they're getting this from. And if you've got to do all the law of the Old Testament, that means you are removing yourself under the grace covering of what Jesus has done for you and positioning yourself under the law. And if, you have, if you're trying to obey the law, you've got to obey the whole law. And if you try to obey the law, you can't make one mistake one time or you're done. It's over. You're imperfect. You can't Add up. You don't. You don't make the cut. And he said, "You you don't want to have that weight on you." That's the beauty of the grace of God, because you can't earn it enough. You can't be good enough. You know. Uh, you hear so many people say, "Man, I, you know, if you ask nine out of ten people on the streets, how do you go to heaven?" Most people are going to say, "What? You just got to be a. You got to be a good person." 
you're a good person, man, I, I'm a good person. I believe that if I'm, if I'm good enough, then I'm going to go to heaven. But my question is, when is good good enough? Is my version of good your version of good? And who's to decide where that good point is? Someone once said, someone famous said, uh, all you have to do is have a warm heart. Does that sound nice? If, if, you, have a, if you have a warm heart, man, and you're a good person, you're, God loves you, and, and you're going to go to heaven. But that's not what our Bible teaches, is it? It says, Christ alone, Jesus alone, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. No, There's no way to the Father except through Jesus Christ, right? And so for our purposes today, what are the things that that you're adding to your life with a motive of trying to earn God's approval. Do you know that, that church attendance doesn't do it, right? We want you to come to church. I love that you're here. I do. I love that you're here. Uh, but if it's coming from a motive where you're trying to earn your place in God, it can't happen. There's nothing that you can do. There's nothing that we can do. There's nothing that I can do to earn God's love for me any more than he already loves me. But so often we get caught up in that mindset because we, all our lives we've been told you got to go out and earn it, right? I mean, you got to graduate high school, you got to go earn that degree, you got to go earn your, your right to have that great job, you got to earn that promotion. And so we superimpose that philosophy of life into our faith. And Paul's like, man, you can't, you, you don't understand, you can't earn it. You can't do it. Nothing that you do is going to be good enough. And he's trying to see that so that people can get free of that thing. And not have to live their lives accordingly. It's that, it's that works-based theology. That if, if you work hard enough, you're going to get there. Paul's like, man, you can't work hard enough. And on the opposite side, it's the, the sloppy grace. You, you know, you can get away with anything you want. God's going to forgive you. Hey, the truth is God is going to forgive you because he loves you a lot. But Paul's saying, listen, when you realize that you don't have to uh, uh, earn the approval of God and that grace covers you, you don't even want to go back. You don't even want to abuse it because it's so good, it's almost hard to believe. It's almost too good to be true, the grace and the love of Jesus, that it causes you to want to stay in that place and never to go, to go back. Happy holiness, right? That when you are happy about putting God first in your life, when you are happy about when nobody else sees uh, that you could cheat on your taxes, but you choose not to because it, it causes something in you where like, God sees this, and I, I, the motive is like, oh man, I just love putting him first in my life. And those, you know, name a thousand little things and a thousand little ways that you could choose to put God first in your life or not. Happy holiness, putting God first, and knowing it's because the grace covers you and you're seated um, with him. You know, uh, not long ago I was flying back to D.C. Uh, with some friends, and, and uh, we were in the airport. We loaded the plane. The plane had difficulties. We got back in the uh, terminal. We were there for a few hours and eventually loaded back on the plane. The plane was fairly full, uh, but my friend noticed that there was two seats. The two first seats and first class were open. And so, uh, for whatever reason, my friend decided to sit in one of the first class seats. I mean, who would normally do that? I'm not sure, but he did. And I saw him, and so I'm thinking to myself, like, oh, man, he must have talked to somebody. He must have, you know, gotten, you know, you know, whatever, tickets, or I don't know what he did. I just thought, here's my friend sitting there. Here's a seat next to him. I'm going to sit in the seat, too. And so I sat in the seat, um, and, and the lady kind of saw kind of a little bit what we were doing. She comes over to us, and she says, the, the flight attendant, uh, she says, uh, excuse me, guys, do you guys have... Uh, tickets for, for, for those seats. And we're like, nope. <laughs> we sure don't. And we're like, can we stay here? And, uh, and she's kind of, we're kind of going back and forth, having this kind of 60 second dialogue with this woman. Uh, and, and eventually she kind of gets to the point where she's kind of like, she's debating whether she should allow us to stay there or not. And finally she's like, She's like, all right, all right, you can, you can stay in first class. And we're like, sweet, awesome, you know? And, um, we're thinking to ourselves, this is, this is great, to the point that even another friend, there was another empty seat uh, right there, uh, and, and this person tried to sit uh, in there, and she wouldn't let him. You know, so we're like, sorry. <laughs> and so here we are sitting in these seats, and, and, uh, and the, the, the flight attendant is talking to us, uh, and, and she knows that we clearly don't belong in these seats, and she, uh, she agrees to let us sit there, and so she literally uh, turns around. She's gone for five seconds, guys, five seconds. She grabs something behind the curtain. She comes back, and she says, gentlemen, can I get you uh, a beverage or a snack? And we're like, what are you talking about? She's like, well, for first class, 
um, guests, you get free beverages and free snacks for this flight. And we're like, lady, you know we don't belong here. <laughs> you know, we don't have tickets for this. And, and, and she's like, but we didn't say that, obviously, but that's what we're thinking. And, and, and it was amazing, though, guys, because the whole flight, she didn't treat us like we belonged in econ economy seating. She treated us like we were supposed to be in first class, like we had paid the surcharge for first class, and we were supposed to be there, and she treated us like that the whole time, constantly. She's like, can I get you another drink? Can I get you another snack? Can I get you a pillow? Can I get you a hot towel? Can I take your trash? Can I rub your feet? Can I, you know, and I'm just like, this is awesome. You know, I had all the leg room in the world. Come on, tall people. It was awesome. And me and my friend were just kind of looking at each other like, this is bizarre. Like, she's, she's, she's treating us like we belong here, but we and her both know that we don't. And I think that's a lot like grace. You know, and you have been seated because of Christ by putting your faith in the perfect work of Jesus Christ and what he's already done for you. All you've done is sit in a seat that was open. You accepted a free gift of salvation. You, you freely walk with Christ because there was a seat that he made available for you to sit in and you sat in it. And there's nothing that you can do to earn it or prove it. The whole time I wasn't uh, trying to, okay, man, we got, we got to figure out how to make sure she knows that we that we deserve to sit in these seats, man. We gotta earn our right to stay here. What can we do to prove our worth to this flight attendant so she lets us stay in these seats? Not, never happened. What, what am I gonna do? She knows I don't belong there. I know I don't belong there, yet she's just, it's, 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 it's her letting me stay there, right? And on the opposite side, that sloppy gray side of using the privilege, never once did we get a little high and mighty about, uh, about knowing that we were sitting in first class and that, man, I want some more ice for my cranberry juice, please. You know, can I please have a hot towel? You're not massaging me. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but that whole idea of, of abusing the right to be where you were seated, never once, the whole time, we stayed in a constant set, me and my own friend, and we're like, this is awesome, man. There was just thankfulness. We're just like, man, this is awesome. I love it. I love it. I don't deserve to be here, but I'm thankful for it, and I don't want it to end, you know? I don't want to ever go back to economy seating, you know? I don't want business class. I don't want emergency seating in economy. I want first class, baby. And, uh, and, and, but, but just that picture of grace, man, that you didn't earn it, you don't abuse it because, because you know who bought it for you. You know what Christ did, and because of that, you know that you don't have to earn his approval for your life. Isn't that refreshing? You, know, you don't have to work for it, man. Guys, the world is working for stuff. So many people in religious faiths are, are working and they're striving so hard. And there's that, there's that constant question mark if they're ever going to be good enough. Most faiths, you don't even realize if you're good enough till you die. 